Chapter 4 At the Summit When we left the snow hole next morning, we saw that we were in a closed gully. We had to climb into an open gully to reach the top of the mountain. I led, Simon followed. The storm had passed, and the clear day made climbing easier. It also made me nervous. I could see all the way down to the bottom of the mountain. Soon, we reached the top of the gully. This was the best place to cross to an open gully because the flutings were thinner. But which way should we go? Right or left? Simon told me to go right. It was the correct choice. I broke the walls of the fluting with my axe and crossed into the next gully. Simon joined me, and then he went first. As Simon climbed to the top of the gully, I suddenly became very nervous. I was standing on very soft snow, and I could see all the way down to the bottom of the mountain. If the snow fell, then we would too. I was very glad when Simon reached the top of the gully and climbed onto the north ridge of the mountain. I joined him. At last we were off the west face of Ciula Grande. We had successfully managed the most difficult climb of our lives. We now had a clear view of the summit. The way up was a steep but easy climb. But we were both very tired. We had done the most difficult part of the climb. The climb up to the top of the mountain was very slow. We were now higher than we had ever been before in our lives and the air was very thin. When we reached the summit, we stood and laughed. We took photographs and ate some chocolate. I felt pleased. I was also worried that climbing was becoming too important in my life. Every new adventure was more dangerous, and I was worried about this. I always felt the same after reaching a summit. I was proud of my success. But the quiet moments, after a difficult climb, made me think about the future. I knew these feelings would pass. There's going to be another storm, Simon said. I turned. He was looking at the north ridge. Thick clouds were coming towards the east side of the mountain. I saw more flutings and steep walls of ice. This was the way down. Suddenly I felt less confident. It didn't look easy. I was also worried because I knew that 80% of accidents happen on the way down. Chapter 5. Into a Storm It started to snow. We went towards the storm. Half an hour later, we were climbing through the clouds and we couldn't see anything. I looked up and noticed the north ridge through a hole in the clouds. We were below it, so Simon climbed back up to the top of the ridge. Suddenly, both Simon and the ridge disappeared in a shower of snow and ice. The snow on the ridge had fallen. I was pulled into the mountain by the rope. Simon hung on the end of the rope on the other side of the ridge. He managed to climb back up, but we were frightened. We knew that the ridge which we were walking on was very unsafe. We continued slowly. Soon, we noticed that the ground below us looked safer. We started to climb down again. It was five o'clock in the afternoon and the light was bad. The temperature was going down and the storm was blowing snow in our faces. I thought that Simon was climbing too low. I shouted to him, but he couldn't hear me because of the storm. I shouted louder and Simon stopped. When I was climbing down to him, the snow suddenly disappeared under me. I fell and crashed into him. Luckily, he didn't fall and that saved us. It was very frightening. You okay? Simon asked. Yes, frightened, that's all, I replied when I could speak again. We've gone too low. Oh, I was thinking we could go all the way down to the glacier, Simon said. You're joking, I said. I nearly killed both of us on this bit. 
We have no idea what it's like below. But that ridge is crazy. We'll never get down it tonight, Simon said. We decided to go east in a straight line and join the ridge again further down. By the time it got dark, we were still over 6,000 metres. Neither of us felt very happy as we dug a snow hole. Simon had frostbite in two fingers. I hoped the frostbite wouldn't get worse the next day. I was sure that we were near the end of the ridge and that we would reach our camp by the afternoon. I hoped so. We only had enough gas for two drinks the next morning, and after that, there would be no more water until we got to the lakes. Chapter 6. A Terrible Accident The next morning, we continued walking along the ridge. I was ahead of Simon. By now, I was tired of the mountain. I just wanted to get down as quickly as possible. Several times, the snow disappeared under me, and I fell into a crevasse. Luckily, none of the crevasses were very deep, but the falls were making me nervous. The last one was the worst. I fell through the snow and saw the whole of the west face below me. How stupid, I thought. I was walking on snow with nothing under it. I shouted to Simon and told him to move to the safe side of the ridge. I continued. I was feeling angrier and more upset every minute. I walked over a small hill of snow. The ridge was flat again on the other side. I walked on for a few metres, then stopped suddenly. I looked down. I was standing at the top of an ice cliff. The ridge was about ten metres below me. I turned round. Simon was behind the snow hill. I started climbing down the ice cliff. I used both my axes and tried to hit them hard into the wall. I was still near the top of the cliff when one of the axes made a strange noise. I pulled it out of the cliff. Then I lifted my arm to hit again. Suddenly, the other axe came out of the ice and I fell. A moment later, my knee crashed into the ice wall and I screamed in pain. The pain seemed to last for a long time. If I've broken my leg, I'm dead, I thought. Everyone said it. If there are only two of you, a broken leg can mean death. When the pain was less, I tried to move my leg and screamed again. It was no good. I had broken it. I looked around. We were still at about 6,000 metres, and I wouldn't be able to climb with a broken leg. Simon would leave me. He had no choice. I thought about it. Left here. Alone. I felt cold at the idea. I wanted to scream, but I knew I had to stay calm. Joe disappeared behind a pile of snow in the ridge. A few moments later, the rope went loose. It meant that Joe had stopped. I waited. I was glad to rest. When the rope moved again, I continued walking. Suddenly, the rope went tight and I was pulled forward. I hit my axes into the snow and managed to stop. I knew that Joe had fallen. I waited. When the rope went loose again, I knew Joe's weight wasn't on it. I walked forward to see what had happened. I reached the edge of the ice cliff and looked down. Joe told me calmly that he had broken his leg. There was a terrible look in his eyes. I didn't want to think about what this accident meant. I put a metal bar in the snow and tied the rope around it. Then I climbed down to Joe. I could see that his leg was badly broken. I gave him some pills for the pain, but I don't think they helped much. At this time, my thoughts were selfish. I knew it would be easier to walk away and try to save myself. I tried to pull the rope down. It wouldn't come. 
I had to climb back up the cliff and get it. The climb to the top of the cliff was the most dangerous climb I had ever done. I almost fell several times, but at least I stopped thinking about Joe's accident. I reached the top of the cliff and untied the rope. I was surprised when I looked back down the cliff. Joe was climbing down a slope away from the cliff. He was hopping slowly on his good leg, and I could see that he was in great pain. I knew then that I could never leave Joe while he was fighting so bravely. I would do everything I could to get us both down the mountain. Chapter 7. Getting Down the Mountain Simon and I decided to tie our two ropes together. That gave us 100 metres of rope. Simon would dig a hole in the snow. Then he would sit in the hole and lower me down. Our plan worked very well. We quickly went down 100 metres, but it was now four o'clock and another storm was coming. We had two choices. We could dig a snow hole for the night, or we could continue down the mountain. We decided to continue down. Simon was lowering me very fast in a terrible storm. I was in great pain because my knee kept hitting the side of the mountain. I felt angry that he was hurting me, but I knew he had no choice. We had to get down quickly. By 7.30 that evening, we knew we were getting close to the bottom of the mountain. It was now completely dark, and the storm was very bad. I knew we should stop, dig a snow hole, and melt some snow for water. But we couldn't, because we had no gas. Just then, I felt the slope getting steeper. I realised that there was another cliff. I screamed to Simon to stop lowering me. He couldn't hear me because the wind was too loud. Suddenly, the side of the mountain disappeared under me, and I fell into space. The rope pulled against my body, and I stopped. I had gone over a steep ice cliff, and I was hanging about twenty-six metres above a black crevasse. I tried to reach the walls of the cliff with my axe. They were too far away. I knew my weight would soon pull Simon off the mountain. When that happened, we would both die. I had to get back up the rope, and I had to do it quickly. My only chance was to use two smaller pieces of rope that I had with me. I could tie these small ropes around the main rope with special knots. Then I could use them to climb to the top of the main rope. My fingers were so cold that I couldn't feel them. It took fifteen minutes just to tie one knot. Then I dropped the other piece of rope. At that point, I knew there was nothing more I could do. I hung on the end of the rope and waited to die. I knew the cold would soon kill me. Welcome to today's chase. I am Miss Reese. I will be today's quiz master. Let's see if you know Touching the Void chapter 4 to 7 better than one of our chases. Today you'll be playing against Anne. So, how to play the game? First of all, you need to decide where you want to where your starting point is going to be. Are you going to be brave and start on the 10 points box? Maybe you're in the middle and not quite sure, and you want to start on a five points. Or if you're, if you just need, if you're just not as sure, start on a three points. But the aim is how the game's going to work is I'm going to ask a question. 
you're going to write the answer you're going to write the answer in your exercise book and then we're going to see if you're correct if you get it right you get to move down one space if the chaser gets it right she also moves down one space but you need to be trying to get back to the safe to the bottom square, the bottom run, which is called we're safe. Once you get there, you're home. You're fine. You're finished. The chaser can't catch you any longer. But you can still keep playing. However, if you do not get the question right, you have to stay in the same place. And if the chaser gets to the same space that you are, the chaser has caught you, and you are finished. But you can still have a go at answering the questions to make sure you know the knowledge. Should we give it a try? So, question one. Even though the storm had cleared, which made climbing easier, why was Joe nervous? A. Because he knew how far they still had to climb. B. Because it started to rain. C. Because he was standing on very soft snow. You've got five seconds to write down your answer. So let's see what the correct answer was. The correct answer will be come up in yellow. It's C, because he was standing on very soft snow. And the red circle, that shows the chaser got it right. Did you get that one correct? So well done if you got that correct. If you got it right, you, need to, you can move yourself down to the next box. If you got it wrong, stay where you are. Anne, the chaser, she got it right, so she's moving down the board. Question two. At the bottom of page 19, where had they reached? A, Southridge, B, Northridge, or C, Westridge? The answer is B. Northridge. Look, the chaser got it right as well. Did you get that one correct? Move yourself down if you got it right. If you didn't, stay where you are. Question three. At the summit, what did Joe and Simon do? A. Took photos and drank hot chocolate. B drew pictures and ate chocolate or C take photos and ate chocolate and the answer is C took photos and ate chocolate oh dear chaser what happened there you didn't read the question properly you put B that is incorrect if you got that question correct you can move down the grid the chaser needs to stay where you are this could be a good opportunity to leave some space between you and the chaser. Question four. On page 22, in how many fingers did Simon have frostbite? A2, B1 or C3? The correct answer is A. He had frostbite in two of his fingers. The chaser also got that, got that one correct. How are you getting on with the questions? I hope you're finding them okay. If you've already got to the safe square, well done. But make sure that you are still playing along to see if you can answer the questions. If you're still on the grid, keep working hard and let, don't let the chaser catch you. Question 5. Which part of his body had Joe hurt? A. Broken his wrist. B. Broken his ankle. Or C. Broken his leg. The answer is C. He'd broken his leg. Ouch.
the final question now question number six if you haven't made it back home yet keep working hard and don't let the catcher chase you if you're already there see if you can get this one correct how many meters was joe hanging over the black crevice a 24 b 26 or c 28 The answer is B, 26. So that is the end of the game now. Did you beat the chaser and make it back home okay? Or did they catch you? Either way, I hope that you have got lots of knowledge about chapter four to seven of Touching the Void. I've been Miss Reese. I've been your host for today. Thank you very much. Chapter 8. Falling. I felt quite pleased after three and a half hours of lowering Joe down the mountain. The storm was very bad, and my hands were terribly cold. My frostbite was worse, but I knew we were close to the bottom of the mountain. Suddenly, I noticed more weight on the rope. I thought Joe was just going over steeper ground. I continued lowering him to the end of the rope. I pulled the rope. This was the sign for Joe to take his weight off the rope. But nothing happened. I waited and still nothing happened. Then I knew that I had lowered Joe over an ice cliff. He couldn't take his weight off the rope. He was hanging in space. I stayed there for an hour and a half and tried to think of something I could do. But things just got worse. I was shaking with cold, and Joe's weight was slowly pulling me off the mountain. Suddenly I started to move. I dug my feet into the snow again, but I knew that it was useless. In a few minutes, we would both die. Then I remembered the knife in my bag. Okay, so on day, for today we're going to read chapter 8, just for the first section. Once you've read it, I want you to think about the key questions. What, was, what should Simon do? Should he cut the rope, or should he not cut the rope? So for today's task, we are going to be drawing a table into our books, and we're going to be thinking about reasons why Simon should cut the rope and why he should not cut the rope. Now if we were in school we would be doing this more as a drama activity and we would take you outside and we'd do the conscience alley where half of you would, would think of he should cut the rope and half of you would think of reasons why he shouldn't. But of course we can't do that so you're going to have to try and think about both angles today. On the next slide there is a success criteria that's that ties out that tape that lays out all the expectations but of course if you want to like if you would like to write more reasons then please do on the slide after the success criteria there's a few ideas that I came up with for reasons why he should cut the rope and for why he shouldn't cut the rope to get you started so hopefully that will give you some ideas you need to write this into your table because tomorrow you're going to be using them into your writing.
So for today's task year five and six, I'd like you to continue the story in role as Simon at the moment where he remembers the knife in his bag. You will need to write in the first person as Simon, so it will be I. Write at least one paragraph. You'll need to write about Simon debating his choices in his head. Use your ideas from your reading task yesterday, where you thought about whether Simon should or should not cut the rope. And then I'd like you to stop writing once he makes the decision. So once he says he's either going to cut or not cut the rope. I've written an example that I will read to you in the next part of the video. So here's my example. See if you can spot any skills that I'm using. And then at the end, if you could pause the video and have a little think about what you're going to write today. Then I remembered the knife in my bag. Thoughts whirled through my aching head like the snowstorm that was surrounding me. Two choices then, cut the rope or leave it. Option one seemed impossible. How could I do this to my friend, my climbing partner? We had started this amazing journey together. Surely we had to end it together. But if ending it together meant us both dying, what would people think of me when I returned alone? As I considered my terrible choice, my hands were frozen, just as my mind was frozen in indecision. Perhaps I could stay here until someone came to rescue us, or somehow I could gather the strength to pull him back up the mountain. I sighed. Deep inside, I knew that these were impossible hopes. If I stayed holding this rope, in minutes, I would be sliding off the face of this mountain and we would both be dead. I only really had one choice. I reached for the knife. So this is just a summary of the task for today. Once you've finished, it just really needs to be one paragraph, a short paragraph today. Please can you leave around 10 minutes to listen to chapter, the rest of chapter eight and chapter nine, because we won't have a lot of time to do that tomorrow. So when you've finished a little paragraph, please listen to chapter eight, the rest of chapter eight and chapter nine. That will come up on the next part of the video. decided quickly. I would have to cut the rope. I didn't have a choice. Carefully, I took the knife from the top of my bag and cut the rope. I started to fall and screamed. Seconds later, I landed on ice and snow in a cold, dark place. I didn't know what had happened. I just knew that I wasn't dead. I realised that I was lying on an ice bridge inside the crevasse. I knew then that I was lucky to be alive. The bridge wasn't flat, and I started moving. Quickly, I put in an ice screw. The rope was hanging through the hole above me. I was sure that Simon was lying dead on the other end. I pulled the rope. I thought it would soon go tight from the weight of Simon's body. But it didn't. It just kept coming. Finally, the other end of the rope dropped through the hole and fell on me. I saw then that it had been cut. You are going to die in here, I thought. But I was also pleased that Simon was alive. I felt very alone and very frightened. I could hear strange noises all around me. I hated the dark. So I turned on my head torch and looked around. I couldn't see any way out. What a terrible place to die, I thought. I was young, healthy, and I had dreams for the future. Now I would die in a cold, dark hole at the bottom of a mountain. Why had I ever come to Siula Grande? Stupid, I screamed. Stupid, stupid, stupid! Sometime after I cut the rope, I dug a snow hole and tried to sleep. I couldn't. I couldn't stop thinking about Joe. 
I hoped he might still be alive, but I knew that was almost impossible. It was a long night. I was afraid and terribly thirsty. I looked at my watch. It was 5 a.m. I had been asleep. I knew Simon was somewhere above me, so I called his name over and over again. The hours went by and there was never any answer. I knew then that I was completely alone. Chapter 9. The Way Out As soon as it was light, I collected my equipment and left the snow hole. By this time, I was sure that Joe was dead. I thought that I was going to die too. It seemed fair. However, I didn't want to just wait for death. I would keep moving while I could. Soon, the ground below me dropped steeply. I climbed down and saw an ice cliff over a crevasse. So that's what Joe went over, I thought. But the most awful thing was the crevasse. Joe had fallen into that deep, dark hole. The idea was terrible. I felt guilty. I knew that if I hadn't cut the rope, I would be dead. But still, I felt guilty. I had survived. Now I was going home, but I would have to tell people what had happened. Who would believe it? Nobody cuts the rope. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you try that? I could imagine the questions. I climbed down the cliff and looked into the crevasse. I didn't have enough rope to climb down inside. Joe! I shouted, but there was no answer. I wasn't surprised. He was dead. When I finally reached the glacier, I was still sure I was going to die. Glaciers are dangerous. There are deep crevasses everywhere. You can't see them because they are covered in snow. You might fall through and die any moment. However, I was lucky. I managed to cross the glacier safely. I had to decide. I couldn't just stay where I was waiting to die. I had to lower myself down the crevasse. It was the only way. I didn't know how deep it was. I only had about 26 metres of rope. If it was very deep, I would reach the end of the rope. Then I would fall and die. But I had to take the chance. Slowly, I started lowering myself down. By the time I reached the end of the glacier, I could hardly stand. I was very tired and thirsty. I found some water on the moraines and had a long drink. But I was feeling bad about Joe. How could I explain what had happened to his parents and my friends? You killed him. They might not say it, but they would think it. I thought about lying. I could just say that Joe had a terrible accident. Just then, I saw Richard. He looked worried. When he saw me, he was surprised and happy. Simon, it's good to see you. I was worried, he cried. I couldn't speak. Richard started looking around for Joe. Perhaps my face told him something terrible had happened. Where's Joe? he asked. Joe's dead. I said. Dead? He said. I sat down, silent. You look terrible, Richard said. Did Joe fall? What happened? Yeah, he fell, I said. There was nothing I could do. Richard gave me some hot tea and chocolate. Then he passed me the medicine bag. I told him exactly what had happened. I couldn't do anything else. Richard listened in silence. I was glad I was telling him the truth. I couldn't lie. When I finished, Richard looked at me. 
I knew something terrible had happened. I'm just glad you managed to get down, he said. He understood. He didn't think I had done the wrong thing. We walked quietly down to the camp. Richard prepared a hot meal. For hours I slept in the hot sun. Then we ate again. I was still exhausted. Slowly, I felt my body becoming stronger again. That evening, there was another storm. We lay side by side in the tent, listening to the storm. It was very, very cold outside. Finally, I fell into an exhausted sleep. After about 25 metres, my feet touched some ice. Opposite me, I saw light through a hole in the roof. There was a slope up to the hole. Suddenly, everything seemed better. This was the way out that I had hoped to find. The only problem was the ice that I was standing on. It wasn't the bottom of the crevasse. It was very thin, and there was nothing under it. I could fall through at any time. I crawled slowly across the ice on my stomach. I was very nervous. I could hear things falling under me. I tried not to think about the thin ice. After a few minutes, I reached the other side. The ice was harder now and I felt safer. I looked up at the light which was coming through the hole in the roof. This is it, I thought. This is the way out. I used my good leg to climb up the slope. I used the rope to help me. I still felt a lot of pain, but slowly the hole got closer. It took over five hours to reach the hole in the roof. Finally, I pushed my head out of the hole. It was a bright, sunny day. The whole world had returned. I was alive. I pushed myself out of the hole and lay on the snow. For a few moments, the heavy weight of pain and fear seemed to lift. We're going to think today about how to give information about the characters' feelings and thoughts through dialogue. So we've got a scene from Prince Caspian, which is a book by C.S. Lewis. So it's in the Narnia Chronicles. When he came to himself, he was lying in a firelit place with bruised limbs and a bad headache. Low voices were speaking close at hand. And now, said one, before it wakes up, we must decide what to do with it. Kill it, said another. We can't let it live. It would betray us. So we've got a little passage of dialogue here. And what I want you to think about is what can you tell about either of these characters? And what gave you the clue? So now you've discussed that section, we've got another piece of dialogue here. Gentlemen, said Caspian in a feeble voice, whatever you do to me, I hope you will be kind to my poor horse. What two things can you tell about Caspian and what gave you the clue? Just pause here to discuss. One way to convey character is the words that you make come out of the character's mouth. So the actual words you're getting the characters to say give us a clue about what kind of character they are and how they're feeling. But there is another way, she explained. It is how you make the character say it. But there is another way, she bellowed. 
It is how you make the character say it. But there is another way, she whispered. It is how you make the character say it. There are several different ways to convey character through dialogue. So you can start with what they say, what the character is actually saying. That can give us a clue as to what kind of character they are or how they're feeling. The second way is how they say it, using verbs instead of said, bellowed, whispered, sang or sneered. In the next part of the video, there's a word bank to help you. The third way is how the character says it, but using adverbs. So they might say something and you just use the verb said, but you're adding said angrily. You're adding an adverb to the verb said angrily, said timidly, said defiantly, said laughingly. The fourth way is to use some description of their voice. We're not going to unpick this a lot, but hot group in both classes, you could definitely give this a go using adjectives to describe the person's voice. And then number five is using action to add a little bit of detail into the speech. So it's what the character is actually doing while they are speaking or shortly after they speak. We're going to look into that a little bit more in a moment. So the speech sandwich is simply a way to use description action and speech to make sure that your dialogue passages are more interesting and that they move the story on or show character. Description might involve who is there, where are they, what do they look like and what do the surroundings look like. Your speech needs to be punctuated correctly but that's the words that the characters are speaking and then action could involve something that the character does or it could add detail about something that is happening in the surroundings. So it doesn't have to go in this order. It doesn't have to be description, then speech, then action. You could have description and action before the speech. You could have some description within the speech, especially how the character is speaking. You can definitely add action uh, to explain clearly what a character is doing while they're speaking. So I'd like you today to have a little go at using the speech sandwich in your free writing task. I've got a passage from the text here and I'm just highlighting and selecting in purple the parts that are speech. So in our speech sandwich, uh, these parts would count as speech. The other parts will be description or action, and sometimes it's quite hard to tell whether it's description or it's action, but in general, description will have a lot more expanded noun phrases and be describing things involving the senses, so what can be seen, what can be heard, and so on. And action is usually a powerful verb and something that is actually being done rather than description. So all of those bits in purple are the speech. This part here, I couldn't speak. Richard started looking around for Joe. Perhaps my face told him something terrible had happened. Now I think here this bit's a bit of uh, action really. It could be description, but I think it's action. I know I couldn't speak is no action really, nothing's happening. But then Richard starts looking around for Joe. His face is showing uh, his feelings. So I think that would be action there. And then a little bit more action here. Richard gave me some hot tea and chocolate. Then he passed me the medicine bag. There's not a lot of description in this section. So that's definitely something we could uh, add into our writing later today. So I've got three pieces of dialogue here and I'm just going to try and model for you how I would add description and action into this section so that we use the speech sandwich. Rather than just having dialogue, we're going to add a little bit more detail, hopefully characterise and move the story on. That's the job of dialogue, to characterise and move the story on. So I'm going to add a little bit of uh, description to start with here. So uh, I want to say that I've just reached the end of the glacier. As I reach the end of the 
glacier. I was so, oh, I should have a comma there. As I reached the end of the glacier, I was so exhausted, I could hardly stand. Icy cold and shaky, I placed my foot carefully, gently, tentatively, I think, tentatively on solid ground. I'm thinking here it's the first time he's just, he's the first time he's been on solid ground since they began the climb. So I'm, I could expand on that there. I'm going to leave it for now. Finally, I had made it. Just as the shock began to hit me, I saw a small figure a few hundred metres away. I'm just going to check that, make that a bit smaller. As I reached the end of the glacier, I was so exhausted, exhausted I could hardly stand. Icy cold and shaky, I placed my foot tentatively on solid ground. Finally, I had made it. Just as the shock began to hit me, I saw a small figure a few hundred metres away. So we're not saying I saw Richard because he's further away. So we're saying I saw a small figure a few hundred metres away. I wanted to run towards it. Semicolon there, year six. So we're linking the two related clauses together. You could just have a full stop if you're not confident with that. Um, hot in year five, you definitely could give that a go. I haven't really explained it very well. Uh, so don't worry too much about the semicolon. I wanted to run towards it. I knew it must be Richard, but my body was too tired. Luckily, so I'm starting with an adverb there, he sprinted across the distance between us and was with me in no time. Now I'm going to go into the speech. Simon, it's good to see you. I was worried, he cried. Add a little bit of description here about Richard. He looked very tired too. Perhaps he hadn't slept. In horror, that's a fronted adverbial of manner, in horror. In horror, he looked me up and down. Maybe I'll choose a different word for looked in a minute. He looked me up and down, his eyes filling with concern. I'm just going to change this looked to he appeared. He appeared to be very tired too. So I don't repeat this word looked over and over. In horror, he looked me up and down, his eyes filling with concern because um, I must have been in a complete state. Can't really describe yourself so much there. You look terrible, Richard said. And now I think I'm going to have it really hit me. At this point, I began to feel so weak. I thought I might pass out, faint. A uh, nice short sentence here. I wobbled. Richard darted towards me and helped me to sit down on a nearby rock. I suppose I could describe the rock, but it's not really relevant there. Uh, he raised his gloved hand. Is that necessary? Well, he raised his gloved hand, I can improve that later, uh, to shield his eyes from the sun and looked back across the glacier. Can't quite fit this all in here, make it big enough for you to see. Um, and looked back across the glacier. Where's Joe? He asked. And we're going to say how he asked. Where's Joe? He asked, trying to sound hopeful. My stomach plummeted. So year five and six, we're on the last writing task uh, of this section. We're going to be choosing any part of the story so far. I've got some suggestions in the next part of the video, and I'd like you to write at least two paragraphs about that part of the story using as many skills as you can. You can be Joe or Simon, depending on the part of the story you choose. You can look back at the text if you want to. 
uh, to help you decide whether you're going to be Joe or Simon, you're essentially going to be rewriting a section of the story. In the next part of the video, there's going to be a list of levelled skills, and I will discuss those briefly with you. I would suggest that you plan your ideas before you start, maybe use a mind map or um, bullet points to just get some ideas down on paper before you start writing your two paragraphs. So my suggestions are any part of the climb so far, so up to the top of the mountain. You could write about the storm in chapter five. You could write about the moment when Joe falls. That's quite a dramatic moment. Um, you've got some ideas from earlier in the week, hopefully from the reading task, Conscience Alley and things like that. Perhaps when Joe manages to escape, that would be a brilliant part to choose. And then the moment when Simon returns to Richard. So I actually have just shown you my example of the moment Simon returns to Richard. I haven't quite written two paragraphs, but that might give you a, a hand. So if you are mild and you can't think of anything, I would suggest skipping back a little bit in the video to look at my example and just do your own version of that section of the text. OK, I'm going to explain the skills for each group on the next part of the video.